Okay, welcome to another lecture. I'm very excited about this one. It's been a while. This one is called Zohar Alumbrados Jesuits. So if you're into that kind of thing, you want to learn something about the history of the satanic world conspiracy and the role of these different secret societies, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. First of all, here's my book, Maybe Everyone is Wrong. I like to promote it because I believe that it is useful to understanding previous prophecy and today's prophecy. I don't make a lot of money on these books. It's getting very good reviews. Here's a list of places where you can buy it. Positive reviews are greatly appreciated, so thank you. Now, I'm not an expert. I'm not making factual claims. All of this that you're about to see is my personal speculation. Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Section 2A, guarantees me religious freedom, which is defined as the right to entertain such religious beliefs as a person chooses, the right to declare religious beliefs openly and without fear of hindrance or reprisal. That is what I will be doing in this lecture. We've been looking at how Satan rules the world. We've concluded that it's by luring mankind into trying to be like God and complicating God's simple wish for us. Now, this is done by spreading the false light of deep secrets, also known as Gnosticism, Luciferianism, Illuminism, Enlightenment, Zohar, and Alumbrados. Remember, Zohar and Alumbrados, Zohar in Hebrew means light, and Alumbrados in Spanish means light. So... And illumination and enlightenment are also obviously light related. So, and Lucifer also, you know, means light. So, this is a very consistent terminology that goes across thousands of years of having this false light instead of just the real light of Jesus Christ. Of course, Satan would pretend to be a, a minister of light, right? So, he claims to have this enlightenment when it's actually deception. What do the Zohar and Los Alumbrados have to do with the Jesuits, though? We want to look at that closer. So let's just go right to the Wikipedia page for Ignatius of Loyola, who's the founder of the Jesuits. Ignatius of Loyola was from the Basque region. You can see there Basque. Uh, a venerated saint, a Spanish Basque Catholic priest. So he was actually a Catholic priest and theologian who, together with Peter Faber and Francis Xavier, founded the religious order called the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits, became its first superior general at Paris in 1541. Now, interesting that it would be Paris, right? Why Paris if he's a Spanish nobleman, a Spanish Catholic priest, why would he establish his order in Paris? The Jesuit order is dedicated to teaching and missionary work. That's what they claim. And we're going to find out whether that makes any sense. Its members are bound by a special fourth vow of obedience to the sovereign pontiff, the Pope, to be ready to fulfill special papal missions. Now, already, this contradicts the idea of them just being teaching and missionaries. Why would teaching and missionaries uh, be also on special missions from the Pope himself, like uh, some sort of secret service spy agency that gets orders from the top? Doesn't make much sense. The society played an important role during the Counter-Reformation. You can say that again. They were responsible for some of the most horrible torture and uh, and persecution of Christians in the history of the world. Very, very evil. So what, which one is it? Are they counter-reformation torture masters who go around trying to find and kill heretics? Or are they missionaries who go around just doing nice things for people? Or are they teachers? 
who, who found academies and universities and teach the next generation what to believe? Or do they go and do special missions? I mean, already you can just see how this isn't actually adding up. If they were just a normal teaching and missionary organization, it makes zero sense for them to play an important role during the Counter-Reformation that we know they did play, as Martyr's Mirror and these other books testify, and their special missions. Well, let's look here. This is France and Spain. Is an actual map. So you have this region right in between those two, and that's the Basque region. When it says that Ignatius Loyola was Basque, it's a special region between France and Spain that doesn't speak Spanish and doesn't speak uh, French. It has its own Basque dialect. Uh, they're kind of separated from both of them, but incorporate both of them. It's this border region. That's where Ignatius Loyola is, so it kind of makes sense why he would end up in Paris, and uh, but yet be Spanish. And so Spain and France are both very powerful empires at this time. And he grew up right on the border of those two. Ignatius Loyola was involved with Los Alumbrados, which was a Zohar-believing mysticism cult that spread enlightenment far and wide in the upper echelons of society and academia. We looked at the Zohar last time. Uh, so let me shrink this down a little bit. I have this too big here. should be better now and under the heading of period of studies um, Ignatius Loyola who was born in Inigo but we're just gonna call him Ignatius Loyola here made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land so we're talking about Jerusalem which at that time was desolate remember uh, or at least you know not not established the way it is today with the aim of settling there so he was already interested in 1523 with going to the Holy Land. And he returns to Barcelona at age 33, whether that's true or not. You know, the number 33 is this magical number in, in uh, mysticism and things like that. So uh, that could be somebody adjusting the history afterwards to make it sound more special. But anyway... Um, he goes to university, he studies theology, he encounters, now it says there when he was in Barcelona studying Latin and theology, he encounters a number of devout women who had been called before the Inquisition. These women were considered alumbrados. And then it itself, in Wikipedia, just take that in. I, it says that the Spanish Inquisition was investigating a Spanish group cult called Alumbrados. And then it says in parentheses for English readers, Illuminati. So Wikipedia itself, you can go to. It's, this is how f it's not a stretch of my imagination or some random claim that Alumbrados was a real thing that Illuminati is, which supposedly only came into existence hundreds of years later. The, the Illuminati came into existence in the 1700s, and here you see the 1500s. The Illuminati was established in a different part of Europe. This was supposed to be established in, in Barcelona and in Spain. So you have here proof or at least evidence that the Illuminati that we think of, you know, everyone knows about the Illuminati if you research conspiracy theories, but nobody ever talks about Alumbrados. Here you have the predecessor of it in Spain at the exact time that Ignatius Loyola is on the scene. And they're even being under question by the Inquisition. Now look, it says a group linked in their zeal and spirituality to Franciscan reforms, but they had incurred mounting suspicion from the administrators 
of the Inquisition. Why? Because they were doing evil. They were doing orgies and black magic and all sorts of things that we looked up with the Zohar. So Ignatius Loyola meets these women there and supposedly has no connection with them, but it's very vague here. Um, you know, he was preaching in the street and these devout women began to experience ecstatic states. One fell senseless, another sometimes rolled about on the ground, another been seen in the grip of convulsions, shuddering and sweating in anguish. They were probably on drugs or possessed by demons or both. And they liked Ignatius Loyola, and he was involved with them. The suspicious activity took place while he was preaching without a degree in theology. That's what they claim here in, uh, in Wikipedia. As a result, he was singled out for interrogation by the Inquisition and was later released. Yeah, it's just because he didn't have a, he didn't have a permit to be preaching the wor good word of God. He was such a man of God, he was going to preach but he didn't have his degree, so, you know, that's why they questioned him. It's not because he was involved with the Alumbrados cult members who were following him around and having some sort of, you know, freaky, uh, sensual uh, convulsions around him. He was so filled with demonic activity that they were, they couldn't even handle themselves around him. Following these risky activities, he moved to France to study University of Paris. He attended the ascetic college de Montaigneau, moving on to the college, different college for a master's degree. So, again, here you have the hints. You have hints here where they can't deny that he was involved with the Alumbrados. They can't deny that he was questioned by the Inquisition. And they have to acknowledge these things, but they're painting it in a way where he's totally innocent. And who gets to write this history? Who gets to spin the idea of what he was really doing there? The Catholic Church, obviously, because they're the ones who would keep these records. So they have to acknowledge this, but at the same time, they're going to try to spin it. I think, obviously, he was deeply involved with this, and we're, we're going to continue to look into whether that makes more sense or not. On the morning of uh, blah, 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 in this certain place, he had six companions. They met and took upon themselves the solemn vows in the, of their lifelong work. It says, subsequently, they were to be joined by Francis Borgia, a member of the House of Borgia, who was the main aide to Emperor Charles V and other nobles. The House of Borgia. Why would the most powerful, ruthless, greedy, politically motivated family in the world at that time stoop down to join a brand new and totally obscure Catholic priesthood focused on education and missionary work? Does that make any sense to you? That would be like the Clintons going and joining a brand new monastery that just started last year and doesn't outwardly seem to have any power or influence or purpose other than just doing nice charity. Why? Why would the Borgias, who serve an emperor, go and join Ignatius Loyola unless there was something very, very special about Ignatius Loyola. Here's the Catholic Encyclopedia. So what are they going to say? Are they discriminating? Let's find out. So con speaking about his conversion, Ignatius Loyola's conversion, it says, at an early age, he was made a cleric. Okay, that's kind of weird. We do not know when or why he was released from his clerical obligations. Oh, another mystery. Look at these mysteries around Ignatius Loyola. 
Francis Borgia comes and begs if he can be a member of Ignatius. He doesn't want to be in charge of it. That's what you would expect from somebody from the Borgia family. They would come by and say, I'm in charge of this now. I rule this. I own you because I'm part of the Borgia family and you're nobody. You're nothing. I serve the emperor. I have all the power. If I want to do something with your organization, I'm going to come in and take it over. But instead, he comes in and submits himself to the superior general, Ignatius Loyola. And if you know the, the Jesuit vows, every person who's in the Jesuits has special vows that they have to completely obey everything that the superior general tells them to do. So you have a Borgia family member coming and becoming the complete slave of a random cleric who outwardly nobody admits he was special or had demonic power or some sort of uh, big influence. They play it down like he's nobody. He's just this humble servant of God. And yet, he was made a cleric somehow. We don't know how. He became released from his clerical obligations. You know, it's, it's said he didn't have a degree in theology. That's why the Inquisition was questioning him. But here, the Catholic Encyclopedia says he was a cleric at an early age. And they don't know how he was released. So the story doesn't make sense. He was brought up in the household of so-and-so. Um... You know, he went to court, but he was not in royal service. This was perhaps the time of his greatest dissipation and laxity. Dissipation meaning drinking, drugs, sex, wanton, whatever selfishness you wanted. That's what dissipation means. You waste your fortune and money on things that are completely vain and useless. So Ignatius Loyola was admittedly here a useless uh lazy, selfish, hedonistic person. We know he's in the Basque region, in between these, these two powerful empires. And he was extravagant and affected. Affected meaning very superficial, very selfish in his vain uh, appearance and wanting to be uh, outwardly respected. About his hair and dress, consumed with the desire of winning glory, that was a big thing back then, is having duels and going on adventures and trying to fit this romantic idea of, of glory. Would have seemed to have been sometimes involved in those darker intrigues for which handsome young courtiers too often think themselves licensed. So we're talking about murder, we're talking about, uh, you know, bastard children impregnations we're talking about possibly even sacrifices cult activity darker intrigues assassinations who knows how far he went in the downward course is still unproved oh yes because they care so much about proof no they just don't want to go through the whole list of crimes that he is probably known to have committed the balance of evidence tends to show that his subsequent humble confessions of having been a great sinner should not be treated as pious exaggerations. So later he would admit that he was into extreme evil, but, you know, even they're saying, let's not treat that as him exaggerating because he was being humble. So there's very few charges, though. Well, when Once you're a powerful member of some sort of secret cult that rules things to the point where you get released from your clerical obligations. Uh, the Francis Borgia comes and worships at your feet and, and wants to become one of your servants. Uh, cult members of the Alumbrados women come by and fall down and have satanic demonic convulsions at your feet. Uh, yeah, there's something about it that, uh, you know, you don't have charges put against you because if you're the stupid policeman, who dared to, that'd be like saying, I'm going to go to Barack Obama and give him a speeding ticket, you know, or, you know, Justin Trudeau, I'm going to go in and, uh, you know, knock on his door and tell him that his, his fence isn't in the correct place. Like that charge is not going to stick. 
you're just going to get yourself fired from your job. So yeah, there probably weren't a lot of charges. In 1517, a change for the better seems to have taken place. He took service in the army. So he loved glory. He loved trying to become famous and influential. He was involved in all sorts of dark intrigues. Now he wants to go into the army. Turning point of his life came in 1521, while French were besieging the citadel of Pampeluna, a cannonball passed between his legs, tore open the left calf, and broke the right shin. He got hit in the leg with a cannonball. That is well known. Uh, with the fall of the garrison, with, with his fall, the garrison lost heart and surrendered. He was treated well by the French and carried on a litter to Loyola, the place where his leg had to be broken and reset. Afterwards, protruding the end of the bone was sawn off the limb having been shortened by a clumsy setting was stretched out by weight all these pains were undergone voluntarily without uttering a cry or submitting to be bound but the pain and weakness which followed were so great that the patient began to fight fail and sink uh he took so this is where the idea of his big uh conversion takes place after this incident Worldly thoughts began to lose their hold, while heavenly ones grew clearer and dearer. Yes, I'm sure that uh, this demonic man was suddenly seeing the light. But which light? One night, as he lay awake pondering these new lights, he saw clearly, he says in his autobiography, the image of Our Lady with the Holy Child Jesus, at whose sight for a notable time, he felt reassured sweetness, which eventually left him with such a loathing of his past sins, especially of those of the flesh, that every unclean imagination seemed blotted out for his soul from his soul. Never again was there the least consent to any carnal thought. Mm, I'm sure. I'm sure. That's why Francis Borgia, you know, wanted to come in because he was such a holy saint, he wanted to come and be his uh, student and his slave. His conversion was now complete. So nothing here about actually hearing the gospel and being truly saved or having any interest in uh, real service to God, but the image of the lady with the holy child Jesus you know, because they always love to have Jesus being a little baby and then worship Mary instead. Uh, that's what really converted him. So everyone noticed that he would speak of nothing but spiritual things afterwards. Well, we looked at how the Zohar uses spirituality as a excuse to get away with everything they wanted to do. His elder brother begged him not to take any more rash or extreme resolution, which might compromise the honor of his family. So his family was actually you know, powerful, their nobility. He wasn't just some random dude. Remember that Alumbrados claim that their sins are not even sins because they simply allow the will of God, by which they mean their God, Satan, to direct all of their crimes and abominations. So they are liberated from the idea of sin by simply letting de demons possess them and then the demons do it and they claim that's God directing them in their whatever evil they do so that's why when it says he never consented to any carnal thought no he didn't have to he'd speak of nothing but spiritual things because in the alumbrados everything is spiritual and everything materialistic which is carnal you don't acknowledge it as being real even though you're the one actually doing the orgies, having the child sacrifice, drinking the blood, doing all of the evil that you would have done before, now you you dress it up in a spiritual language and you say God is doing it and that's how you justify it. So that's the Loyola conversion story. Here's their logo. Society of Jesus, IHS 1540. And... 1540 is important to remember just how far before this is in between it's a couple hundred years after the Zohar and it's a couple hundred years before Illuminati 
is officially established. They're in between those two. Here's the Catholic Encyclopedia on the Illuminati. Yes, they actually have a page on it. It says right underneath Illuminati, Alumbrados. The name assumed by some false mystics who appeared in Spain in the 16th century. That's the 1500s. That's when uh, Ignatius Loyola was around. And claimed to have the direct, direct intercourse with God. Wow, isn't that convenient? So what's, when it, since they're talking about Satan as their God, then yes, they, they would have direct intercourse with him, I suppose. They held that the human soul can reach a, such a degree of perfection that it contemplates, even in the present life, the essence of God and comprehends the mystery of the Trinity. All external worship, they declared, is superfluous. The reception of sacraments, useless, and sin is impossible in the state of complete union with him who is perfection itself. Carnal desires may be indulged, and other sinful actions committed freely without staining the soul. That's exactly what we're talking about, Ignatius Loyola. The highest perfection attainable by the Christian consists in the elimination of all activity, the loss of individuality itself, so you allow spirits to take you over, and you don't you aren't an individual anymore, you're multiple, you have legion within you, like the story in the Bible. The complete absorption of God. So here it goes on to talk about uh, some of the history of that and Illuminism uh, and how there are these female leaders in the, this whole thing. It says uh, near Cordova, who, however, in 1546, this is six years after the Society of Jesus is founded, solemnly abjured the heresy, so rapidly did the errors gain ground that the Inquisition proceeded with relentless energy against all suspects, even citing before its tribunal St. John of Avila and St. Ignatius of Loyola. So we have the connection again between Illuminati or Alumbrados and Ignatius Loyola. This is not Wikipedia. This is the Catholic Encyclopedia. You could have a major difference between those two if you wanted to. But both of them take the time to specifically mention that Ignatius Loyola was connected with Alumbrados, and this led him into the Inquisition. Now, they dress up the story differently. Wikipedia has this thing about how he was being followed around by these women that he had nothing to do with. And this one just says that, you know, because of the Inquisition was so obsessed with the uh, with the Alumbrados, they just, I guess, randomly picked Ignatius Loyola and said, you know, hey, we're going to investigate you too. You see how here they're not talking about how he just didn't have a degree in theology? Here they're actually saying it was because of his connection with the Illuminati, with Alumbrados. So they can't get their story straight because there is a connection there but they don't want, neither one wants to admit what it really was. Wikipedia has their own story. This one just glosses over why they would ever question Ignatius of Loyola. So we can go and, you know, look between the lines here and see there's something very strange about this man uh, who has this unprecedented level of power and authority out of thin air when he should have been locked up and convicted for his intrigues and his crimes. Instead, he's given more and more and more leeway, more and more power, more and more followers, higher level nobility, and, you know, royalty coming in and serving him. Here's the some notes on the design of this logo. It's got the essentially a compass rose of navigation sort of look to it, if, you, if you're familiar with the compass rose. Um which was very huge at that time, you know, exploration, sea, navigation. This was the age of sail. Uh, black sun rays. You have darkness posing as light. This black sun rays coming off. And three nails uh, underneath IHS there for the symbol of always crucifying, always killing Christians. And if you add up the number of points, 
along this whole thing, it's 32. Now, here, let's look at these 32 paths in the Kabbalah, the so-called Jewish Kabbalah, mysticism, Zohar mysticism, the tree of life. If you've ever looked into this stuff, there's no reason you should. It's not in any way going to help you. It is occult. It is satanic. It is Luciferian. But if you do look it up, there's 22 paths and 10 sephiroths, and that adds up to 32 paths. So you'll hear about the 32 paths, and that's how many points there are on this particular compass. Isn't that interesting? So you have the Zohar first, then with the conversos and, and their beliefs, then you have the Society of Jesus combined. They just happen to have 32 points on their thing. You can go to a website called 32 Paths, and it will ask, where did the Kabbalah originate? It says, most scholars believe Kabbalah predates world religions. We know that's not true, but that is what most scholars believe, according to this website. Forming the primordial blueprint for creation, philosophies, religions, sciences, arts, and political systems. So they, they believe that the Kabbalah is actually pre-religion. It is so true and, and early. The earliest known Jewish text on magic and cosmology, the Sefer Yetzira, Book of Creation, appeared sometime between the 3rd and 6th century. Okay. That's the earliest known Jewish text on magic and cosmology, but it's hundreds of years after Jesus. So they've rejected the Messiah. They have teamed up with Rome to kill the Messiah in the Bible. That's Pontius Pilate and all of that. The temple gets destroyed. The Pharisees that hated Jesus take over the leadership of Jews at that time. And then they go on to write this book on magic and cosmology. And it explained creation as a process of involving 10 divine numbers or sephirot of God, the creator, and 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Taken together, they were said to constitute, constitute the 32 paths of secret wisdom. So here we have the 32 paths, the Kabbalah mysticism. It is from this reference that came the name. This website was derived, obviously. Translated as splendor, radiance, actually just basically means light or shining light. The Zohar is a collection of written mystical commentaries on the Torah and considered to be the cornerstone of Kabbalah. Written in Aramaic, the sacred teachings were compiled in the second century. No, they were not. They were written in like 1200s by a liar who claimed they were ancient. They were written at a time when Jews wanted desperately to become relevant in the conversation of the debate between Christians and Muslims in the Middle Ages. And so they reached back and created this mythology for themselves and incorporated a lot of myth, mysticism that was already around, and they tricked a lot of people. Here's a different website, Higher Self. Kabbalistic demonology. Listen to this nonsense once you get into this. This is just sort of a side thing, but you can see the 32 path tree of life Kabbalah thing there on the side. Keeping the Baphomet fields active with the spreading and proliferation of satanic ritual abuse, blood sacrifice, sexual depravity, uh, and sexual depravity ensured that the earth population would not be able to achieve sacred marriage within and ascend and that the Sophianic female principle would remain enslaved in dark matter through the alien machinery that runs the Dark Mother reversals. Did you catch that? Because they're trying to turn the Catholic Church's evil into something that we can solve using this Zohar Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalistic teachings. 
For these purposes, the Luciferian sect, the Luciferian Knights Templars, combined with the interpretation of Gnostic mysteries with Kabbalic demonology to be translated into the opposing path of mystical Catharism in which they could achieve a magical practice or sorcery. Now, this is probably actually what Ignatius Loyola was involved in. This is like Zohar, Kabbalistic, uh, dark, Alumbrados kind of stuff. But the thing is, they're spinning it here with their own craziness, of course, to discredit anyone who would criticize it. And so it goes on to black magic rituals, ri rigorous debauchery, defilement. Nothing was regarded as illicit. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show that because you can see uh, that secret societies, Knights Templar, the the Tree of Life, the 32 paths, they're all its own related nexus of lies. Here you have Freemason, uh, Freemason symbolism and the a diagram of how it works. You've got the entered apprentice, the fellow craft, and then it goes up to the master mason, which is actually basically the starting point of Freemasonry. That can spin off to the Order of the Eastern Star. You have the Order of White, uh, White Shrine of Jerusalem. The Order of the White Shrine of Jerusalem. So why is Jerusalem being discussed in Freemasonry in the Order of the Eastern Star with the Satanic Pentagram? And there at the top of the screen, you see this intimate secretary uh, with Hebrew in it. And so you've got this, this tying together of secret societies and Jewish symbolism. Here you see, uh, like I said down here, Freemasonry recruits Protestants into Zohar mysticism with 32 degrees and obsession with Israel and Judaism or Jerusalem. Uh, here's the list. You can see it's going up towards 32 I don't have the whole screenshot here, but you have this Hebrew uh, laid out You in the, what is that, intendant of the buildings, um, goes up to Prince, Prince of Jerusalem. That's one of the titles you can get in Freemasonry. Knights of the East and West, Knights of the Rose Cross, Chief of the Tabernacle, Prince of the Tabernacle. So... You know, this stuff keeps getting more. There's the Star of David, as they would call it. So, Zohar influenced secret society was creating it, created to form a secular kind of conspiring nobility centuries before the reestablishment of Israel by the UN after World War II. So, this is like, you know, Freemasonry is, is after um, the Jesuits were created. But it's like, my point is that you just have this recurring thing about secret societies, illumination, being gaining power as you get deeper and deeper into the satanic cult. And then it ends up circling back to Israel again. So let's learn more about the Jesuits and their special... Oh, and the 32, of course. 32 degrees here in Freemasonry, tying directly into the 32 paths of the Kabbalah, Tree of Life, and all of that stuff. So you can see how it, in hindsight, you can see how it's just Zohar lies being spun in different ways. Let's learn more about Jesuits and their special treatment by the papacy. Here's page 141 of Military and Religious Life in the Middle Ages and at the period of the Renaissance. It says, uh, in the 16th century, the Spanish knight... Don Ignacio de Loyola, who became so famous as the founder of the Order of the Jesuits, made himself a knight of the Virgin. Remember, she, he had this vision of the Holy Mother or the whatever it's called, Our Lady. Uh, so he made himself a knight of the Virgin. It says, uh, the members of the Order of Jesus, founded in Paris by the Spanish nobleman, St. Ignatius Loyola, on his return from a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, from this period, devoted themselves closely to the work of social regeneration, an undertaking which, looking, looked at in all its different phases, 
seemed as if it could only be brought about by means of religious reform. While St. Francis Xavier, the friend and companion of St. Ignatius, made use of the influence of the Order of Jesus to convert the idolatrous people of the Indian Ocean, the Jesuit clerks, a learned and highly intellectual body, so they're learned and highly intellectual, this is an elite group, in a short time obtained a hold over the whole world. What? They obtained, in a short time, a hold over the whole world? How? Why did they not have resistance? Forming one vast army, which answered as one man to the commands of the Holy See, meaning the papacy, and whose representatives were everywhere to be met with, in the professional chairs, in the schools, in the affairs of state, and more especially in the various domains of literature, science, and art. Thus, the 16th century, during which Luther and Calvin made such an onslaught upon the Catholic Church and the monastic orders, gave birth to a new religious order, which, though the most recent, was the most powerful and invincible of them all. I'm sorry, how does that add up at all? How does this guy go from being a soldier who has this bad history, somehow gets to be a priest, but then has his obligations canceled, commits all these crimes, but has no charges against him, gets investigated by the Inquisition for being connected with a demon cult of the Alumbrados, and then just gets the charges dropped and gets let free, then goes and become goes to Israel or wants to go to Israel and then comes back, studies at a university, and suddenly the Pope gives him the most powerful order that has ever existed, sends six him on the Christians who are trying to have the biblical renaissance, the, the, the biblical reformation to actually have the Bible in the language people can understand, to actually, you know, destroy the Catholic Church's lies and reform things and, and get back to God, he gets sent to attack them as harshly as possible, taking over affairs of state, professional chairs, school leaderships, and especially literature, science, and art, which are things that the Catholic Church did not have you know, a good hold of, even though they tried to, you know, through simple force, control those things. Now they were actually leaders of those fields through the Jesuits. And the answer is one to the commands of the Pope. It just makes no sense unless this guy was an extreme leader of some sort of secret cult that was blackmailing people or had demonic influence. I believe, breaking of the third seal of the revelation. Why would a random Basque soldier be allowed by the Pope to have unique organization, methodology, conduct, and missions? Here's just some of the interesting things about how they differ from other Catholic orders. They vow not to accept ecclesiastical dignities. They have increased prohibition, uh, probations. The novi novitiate is prolonged from one year to two, and with a third year, which usually falls after the priesthood. Candidates are moreover at first admitted simply to simple vows only, solemn vows coming much later on. So like a secret society, you're not actually a real member until you prove yourself. So Jesuits can have this sort of filtering effect, and then only the ones that take the serious vows actually become the assassins, the high-level occult members. Society does not keep choir, does not have a distinctive religious habit, even though they're a religious order, does not accept the direction of convents, is not governed by regular triennial chapter, is said to have been the first order to undertake officially by the virtue of its constitutions active work such as the following missions, at the Pope's bidding, like special ops, special forces, a special military order, they're basically the, the origin of what we call special ops. Military order that is so elite, it goes into special missions 
directly from the leader, the, the commander in chief, and you know secret missions. The education and youth of all classes, the instruction of the ignorant and poor, and ministering to the sick, prisoners, etc. So, this they're very different from a normal religious order, and we're just supposed to believe out of thin air with no justification, no plausible reasoning for why that this is just how Ignatius Loyola rolls and everyone was cool with that. Everybody else has to submit, even bishops, even cardinals have a more restrict and limited authority than the Jesuits that just get to run rampant and do anything they want. Pope Paul III um, He's the one that actually establishes or authorizes the Jesuits. You know, he initiated the Counter-Reformation with the Council of Trent in 1545. Uh, and, you know, the wars of religion with Emperor Charles V. We're talking about the, the Borgia family that was serving Ch Charles V. So you have the Council of Trent, Charles V, Jesuits all directly tied together. Uh, campaigns against the Protestants in Germany. He recognized the Jesuits, the Barnabites. Um, and here you have how this Pope was distracted by his illegitimate son, Pier Luigi Farnese. And the Farnese's are rumored to be one of the most powerful families in the entire world, part of that Venetian nobility um, so you have this despicable, fornicating p pope who creates this great holy order, this great teaching minister of the Jesuits. Oh, and they also go and kill and murder and slaughter and torture all these innocent Christians. But, you know, they were just this scholarly, uh, unconnected, random group of noblemen, soldiers who, you know... Ignatius Little walking around with a cane because his leg got hit with a cannonball. He's just this nice guy who wants to uh, help people learn about Jesus. Everything about this screams satanic world takeover to crush the Protestant Reformation at all costs, recruit the most evil satanic demon-worshipping cult you can possibly get. Instead of trying to stop them, you use your enemy to your advantage and incorporate them as your attack dog. Here you can see Paul III was a significant patron of Michelangelo. So you have the naked men, the whole homosexual art revival around that time with the Catholic Church. And uh, yeah, it's all tied to the same thing. Here's a book called Concerning Jesuits by the Catholic Truth Society. So again, you're not getting it from some random source here. This is about as Catholic as you can get. It says, so much is said and written about the Jesuits that information concerning them should be much in demand. Unfortunately, however, the majority of speakers and writers who undertake to provide instruction for the public do not deem it necessary first to obtain it for themselves, but allowing prejudice to take the place of knowledge, repeat old fables, invent new ones with such persistence and assurance as to induce readers to believe that what is so confidently asserted must needs be true. So this is a Catholic, the Catholic Truth Society is the one publishing this. But you can see here that at one point, the Jesuits were famous and very controversial. Today, nobody even knows who they are. But you go back and you read this actual, oops, you read this actual, uh, I believe that's 1902 is when it's actually, uh, well, I messed up the window here. 1902 is when it's actually published. So this is old. And at that time, in, 19, in the early 1900s, people knew about this. So let me see if I can uh, enlarge my screen here so I can read this. Undoubtedly, the Jesuits are here, as here portrayed, will be far less romantic and picturesque than the hands of various popular authors. So guys like uh, the writer of Sherlock Holmes, talked about the Jesuits being evil. Everybody at this time, before World War I and II, they knew about how evil the Jesuits were, and it was a popular topic. Um, oh man, I messed up my 
window size here. Just have to do this, I guess. So here we have, uh, it says that they were providentially called, well, let, it's talking about the origin of the Jesuits, right? It says, it is said that when he saw the plan, the Pope saw the plan of the society and realized its object, meaning its purpose, the Pope exclaimed, the finger of God is here. And truly, it seemed as though the order of Jesus had been providentially called into existence at that special moment of world's history. Only 20 years before, Martin Luther had raised the standard of rebellion against the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and his baneful influence had already spread throughout England, Sweden, Norway, and a portion of France and Germany. It seemed consistent with God's watchful providence that in the presence of pressing dangers that threatened the Catholic Church, a new body of trained soldiers be raised to fight her battles. And they are talking about literal murder, literal assassination in war. The Pope evidently realized to the full providential use of their new institute. Only two years after it had been given its solemn approbation, we find him sending its members as his representatives to Ireland and Scotland. A little later, in 1545, he gave them a still greater proof of confidence by appointing the fathers Lainez and Salmerin, theologians of the Holy See, at the Council of Trent. Other members of the order were about the same time employed in Germany to defend the Catholic faith against so-called reformers. So they take off like that, just... Out the gate, they are a rocket ship that is going to the highest level of power around the world. And no explanation is given as to how they earned that level of trust. It's like, it's almost like that was a pre-existing society called Alumbrados that had all these powerful international connections. And they just sort of seamlessly slipped in as a by recruiting, uh, by becoming a Catholic order led by Ignatius Loyola, they suddenly uh, became this new organization called the Jesuits. It is easy to understand after perusing the constitutions of the Society of Jesus that the idea of St. Ignatius was to place at the service of the church a body of soldiers always under arms and ready to be employed. According to circumstances, as missionaries, writers, theologians, teachers of youth, controversialists, preachers, and directors of souls, he was careful not to impose upon them long vigils, fasts, corporal penances, or even recitation of the divine office in common that form so distinctive a feature in the legislation of contemplative orders. So that's a lot of language to say that they were a completely unique military service that was being emergency authorized to do anything and everything necessary to kill Protestants and to overthrow their nobilities so that the Catholic Church could retain its grip on humanity. Here you have the Society of Jesus is divided into provinces, each of which includes a certain number of houses and is governed by a provincial, uh, assisted by consultors and an admonitor. Each house has a local superior who likewise has his consultors and his admonitor with whom he shares his responsibilities. At stated times, the general received from the different provincials and also from the local superiors a detailed report of the province. So you can see they're chopping up the land and creating a network, a spy agency to file reports and keep an eye on everything that's happening. It's the modern CIA back then with 1500s technology, just sheer military intelligence being reported, spied on, and then they were authorized to go and kill whoever they need to kill. The mainspring of the whole organization of society is a spirit of entire obedience. See, they say it themselves. Let each one, writes St. Ign Ignatius, persuade himself that those who live under obedience ought to allow themselves to be moved and directed by divine providence just like the Alumbrados claim that God is the one doing the sinning, not them, through their superiors, just as though they were a dead body which allows itself to be carried anywhere and to be treated in any manner whatever, or as an old man's staff which serves him who holds it in his hands in whatsoever way he will. So total 
absolute tyrannical obedience to St. Ignatius, he had everybody under his iron grip. And we're just supposed to believe he was just some random dude that the Pope decided he should rule the world. Here you have uh, Ed Edwin A. Sherman, the Engineer Corps of Hell, has some quotes from various Jesuits. This one talks about regicide and how they were okay with the idea of regicide. They had been preached. Regicide is where you kill a king or a leader of a country. So, uh, yeah, they, they authorized it from 1541. The Jesuits maintained that they were calumniated by their enemies, uh, meaning they were lied about. But they themselves shall supply us with weapons and condemned for their acts and words. So here you have uh, an example of some people. You can read it. Uh, this guy says, a famous Jesuit, page 130 in his book, that every subject can assassinate his prince when he has assumed the power of the throne as a usurper. So if the Jesuits decide that somebody has usurped the throne, they're not a legitimate Catholic, good Catholic prince, just every single person is legally allowed to go and assassinate them, put a bullet in their head, because the Catholic Church, through the Jesuits, officially authorizes you to do so. Here's another one. We read in Moral Decisions, Italian Jesuit, page 158 of his book, that it is lawful to kill an unjust aggressor, though he may be a general, a prince, or a king, that innocence is always useful as injustice, that a prince that will mistreat, maltreat citizens is a ferocious beast, cruel and pernicious, that it is necessary to annihilate. So they're just openly authorizing assassinations of world leaders if they don't obey the Catholic Church. And of course, when they oppress citizens, they're just talking about Catholics not being allowed to run society because the Protestants were having their own power structure. Here we see Jesuits endorsing regicide. Got that. The gunpowder plot is a classic example. Uh, broke out in England in 1605, was hatched by the Jesuits. The Jesuit general, uh, Jesuit Gerard, who administered to the oath-bound conspirator, and the father Garnett exclaimed in a public prayer, O God, destroy this perfidious nation, speaking of England, extirpate from the earth those who live in it to the end that we may joyfully render to Jesus Christ the praises that are due unto him. So they kill and destroy nations in the name of Jesus. That is extreme blasphemy. That's what we see in Revelation. They, you know, have the la horns of the lamb, but a mouth like a dragon. The second beast of Revelation. English Parliament, having returned promptly to its day of solemn session, but discovered the conspiracy in time and took prisoners the guilty. Uh, yeah, so the plot was to blow up the entire Parliament of England and kill everybody inside of it with gunpowder. That's why it's called the gunpowder plot. So he was asked about it. He said that it is, if it is beneficial to the Catholic faction uh, in this and having a greater number of the guilty than of the innocent, we may make it legal to destroy them all. So even if there's a bunch of innocent people, it's worth killing a bunch of innocent people in order to get at those pesky heretics that they hate. Uh, the, the true Christians, if, the, if they can kill some innocent real Christians who serve God, it's worth taking out some of their own members or some bystanders who aren't even involved. This is the type of logic you get with the Catholic Church and the Jesuits. Jesuits were tasked with destroying Protestants, reclaiming the world on behalf of the papacy using any means. Alumbrado's spiritualism allowed them to perform any sins or crimes without guilt because they believed that, that you were just a dead body, that God was the one acting through you, so nothing you did was ever wrong. Their education was aimed at weaponizing every class against biblical Christianity and monopolizing all higher education. So they wanted to go from being just the Catholic Church, just 
takes university teachers who are saying something different than they teach and executing them in the Inquisition, now the Jesuits want to infiltrate and educate everybody themselves and become the leaders of education through the Zohar sort of style of, of deception and secrecy and false teaching. Now, we're going to stop this one short here because I didn't realize this was going to go to an hour already, but we have a lot more to talk about. So next question is, how did England become the leader of the Luciferian conspiracy? So come back for that. It shouldn't be too long before I get that lecture up as well. Thank you for listening.